Thanks, Maz. I hope people don't mind if I drink coffee while I talk. We've been in the country for about 48 hours, and in Australia, we're in Sydney, it's about half past midnight now, so I probably need this. Um, although Brian and I have come from Australia, we're not from Australia originally. Brian's Irish and I'm British, so I am also European for another six months. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we work in Sydney, and we're hospital physicians. We work in emergency medicine and intensive care, but we also spend a lot of our time and energy and careers doing pre-hospital and retrieval medicine for what we abbreviate to Sydney HEMS. We work for the New South Wales Ambulance Service. And we've got three bases. We've got five helicopters. We've got uh, a lot of staff. And most of our work is carried out by a physician paramedic team. We have flight nurses too who work on fixed wing retrieval. But generally, a doctor works with a paramedic when he or she starts their shift for a 12-hour day or night shift. And our service model includes specialists like us, but also trainees, which we call registrars, equivalent to residents. And the trainees we get come for either six months or 12 months. So every six months, we run a training course, an induction course for new doctors, for the registrars. And we get new paramedics and also existing HEMS paramedics that come on the course and train together with them as a team. Our Caseload is interesting. We can do complex critical care, balloon pump retrieval, ECMO retrieval, just standard ICU, septic shock on vasopressors and a ventilator. That's our, our bread and butter. That's about 50% of our work is into hospital critical care retrieval, but about 50% is pre-hospital trauma. And uh, we could go from an inter-hospital septic patient to doing a roadside resuscitative hysterotomy within the same shift. So we have to be prepared for that. We could have multiple casualties. We could go to a complex extrication and end up working with multiple different agencies, rescue services, fire service, volunteer rescue agencies, the police. So we interact with huge numbers of different services, different professions, different people and some of those interactions can be really challenging particularly in some of the more remote or smaller or sometimes larger hospitals where you meet people uh, with different treatment goals maybe from what we have as the retrieval team and we have to learn to manage those interactions constructively collaboratively but with the right outcome for the patient so that sort of demonstrates the wide range of skills that we need not just clinical but non-technical human factors skills. And the way we try and breed those skills or instill those skills into our teams is with the HEMS team induction course. And over the next half an hour or so, I just wanna share with you some learning points because as the director of training for Sydney HEMS, I've been managing the induction course for eight or nine years now. And We've learned so much along the way. Uh, it would be really nice just to share some of that stuff because I've no doubt the challenges we face cross other critical, into critical care areas, whether it's operating room anesthesia, intensive care, pre-hospital care in Denmark. Yeah, we face sim very similar challenges. Um, so here's kind of 10 tips, if you like, 10 things we've learned to do to make our induction course fit for purpose. So the first one is We've learned to link governance with training. Brian is going to talk about our governance structure, which means quality improvement um, in more detail. But we have several ways of looking at cases to see how we can improve our practice. One of them is with daily coffee and cases. So as a team on base, we will sit around and discuss all the cases from the last 24 hours and look for learning points. We might have a case we did a week ago that we really want to talk about, so we'll include that one too. But we try and do that 365 days a year. Um, and it's an informal process, has partly a debriefing role, but mainly it's just to look for common themes that we could do better. And more often than not, it's not the clinical things that could have been better when a job wasn't perfect. It's these non-clinical, non-technical or, or human factors skills. So that's on a kind of micro day-to-day -day level, but on a more macro level, we have formal audit, morbidity and mortality every, uh, every month. 
We have an airway audit, we have a blood audit, we have an ultrasound audit. We've got audit coming out of our ears. Uh, we're great believers in looking at data and trying to see how we can improve. But in addition to looking at things that could have gone better, we look at things that we think went really well. Learning from excellence or awesome and amazing, A and A. Um, so every month we'll also look for cases that we're really proud of um, and try and share the learning points from that case, what went well and why. So through the M&M, the airway audit, the other audits, we try and build in the knowledge, the skills and behaviors into our training programs. So, and we've got this great opportunity every six months to further hone it, to further improve it. It's, it's like an evolutionary process. Um, so that's number one tip. If you can link in your QI and audit with your training and keep repeating that cycle, you, you find that you can remove some of the issues. I can talk about specific examples later on if, if anyone wants, but there are things that weren't going well, we learned from them, introduced them to training, and they just don't happen anymore. Number two is getting hands-on. So people like to learn by doing rather than just watching slides, or listening to presentations. So when our doctors and paramedics arrive for the induction course, they've already done the theory online. We have a virtual learning environment. They visit that, they complete a number of modules, and when they've completed those, they come on the course and they just start getting onto the equipment and the workshops and the simulations straight away. So we don't have any lectures in our induction program. We think they're a waste of time. Uh, everything is hands-on. Here's something that's really changed the way we do things. So we are a popular place to work and we get some really high quality applicants for our registrar posts. So we know that when they come and work for us, they're already really good clinicians. There's no doubt they can do the job medically. And because they're high performing individuals, they're there in a workshop or in a sim wanting to show how good they are, really wanting to excel. But the patient doesn't care about the individual. The patient cares about the team output. So right from day one, we put them in teams, doctors and paramedics, and say, okay, doc, you've got to get your paramedic through this course. Paramedic, you've got to get your doc through this course. And it completely changes the mindset. They're no longer trying to shine in front of everyone else. They're trying to get their buddy to shine. They're trying to get their team to shine. And the effect it has on collaboration, on teamwork, on morale uh, is fascinating and on performance. And we assess that team performance uh, at the end of the course. And teams are great because, as we were talking about earlier during the Repel course, we have pre-specified team roles. So the idea is that our doctor and our paramedic, when they go onto scene, each one knows what the other one is going to do. They, they have expectations um, because they've trained with that individual or their colleague and they'll arrive on scene together, take a handover, and then their roles will diverge for a period of time. The doctor will do the clinical assessment, the paramedic will do the logistic, the scene assessment, make an exit plan, decide where we're gonna establish a workspace and work from. And then we'll come back together and announce our findings and share the clinical and logistic plan and then crack on. And delegating stuff uh, that we can delegate to other personnel on scene. All right. The next tip, this is my favorite bit, this, we try and install mindware into people. So in any system with humans in, I like to think about we have hardware, we have software, and we have mindware. Right. So what's the hardware? The hardware is the equipment we use, the kits, the helicopter we arrive in, it's the trauma packs that we've just made a huge mess of in this traumatic cardiac arrest scenario. Um, this isn't the way we recommend we lay our equipment out, this was a training session. So. Um, but yeah, the, the equipment's the hardware. The software is the systems within which we use the equipment. So it might be our standard operating procedure for traumatic cardiac arrest. Or it might be the checklist we use before we depart scene, or an airway checklist, or some of the pediatric reference cards for drug dosages and equipment sizes and so on. That's the software that we use to help us get the job done with the hardware. But the mindware is really where all the juicy stuff is. And there's some components to mindware that we really work on. The first one is attitude or mindset. 
There's two books that we recommend, or I personally recommend the service doesn't officially endorse these publications, but I just say that I've learned a lot from these books. I recommend our registrars read them. So An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth by Commander Hadfield is a Canadian uh, astronaut who was commander of the International Space Station, among a number of other missions, is a really good general guide to thriving in life. And there are a lot of parallels between critical care and working in space, really, in terms of how hard you have to train, how you have to simulate everything, how um, much of what you do in your job is routine, but there might be some very, very exciting moments. And some of the things that uh, he's big on in this book is something called expeditionary mentality. So when the astronauts are training together on Earth, doing ex expeditions in the wilderness, he says the people that thrive, the people that become excellent astronauts, are the ones that continually ask themselves this question. They ask, what can I do to get this team to where it needs to go? What can I do to get this team to where it needs to go? Um, and they're the ones that become great astronauts, that do well in, the, um, in those wilderness expeditions and do well in space. The ones that aren't quite so happy are the astronauts that define themselves by the one exciting sexy space mission that they may or may not do in their 20 or 30 year career. Um, and it's, it's a fact that yeah, the vast majority, more than 90% of an astronaut's career is gonna be spent on Earth. The, the training, simulating, doing all the stuff on the ground, or just being the backup person who may go into space if the A-team gets gastroenteritis the night before launch, then you have to be ready for that mission. But knowing that they, they probably won't get gastroenteritis, so you probably won't go into space. And having to live with that can be tough. And it can be like for us. So, you know, we can do a 12-hour helicopter shift and be out all day doing cool stuff, or we can turn up and sit on the ground and have no jobs, but see the other team go and get tasked to, to interesting missions. And so, um, an astronaut's happier if she defines herself by someone who is there to support human exploration of space rather than someone who's going to do that space mission herself. And with us, we try and tell our teams, you know, you're here to further pre-hospital and retrieval medicine. You're not necessarily going to be the one that does the clamshell thoracotomy. <coughs> but if you're there uh, helping load the blood box and the ultrasound onto the helicopter when the other team is going out to that mission, you're part, you, you know, you're part of the overall bigger project. Um, so that, that's got some great stuff in terms of the appropriate mindset, the expeditionary mentality, be there for the team, further the specialty, look after the patients. It's not about you, it's about the patient. Extreme ownership uh, has a lot of parallels with that, isn't really time to go into it at the moment. But that's part of the mind where is attitude. Another part of mindware, which we've looked into a lot over the last couple of days on the repel course, is how we manage stress, how we mitigate stress when it's affecting us, or how we avoid stress altogether. So there's this concept of a threat challenge appraisal. Right? I am faced with a task. It might be to resuscitate a sick baby. Um, and I'm going to interpret that task relative to my resources, all right? Is that task too hard for the resources that I have? That will cause a stress response, autonomic hyperarousal, tachycardia, fear, sweating, narrowing of my vision, and so on. Or alternatively, do I feel that I have the resources, the training, the backup, the equipment, the teammate, the systems to manage this sick baby? This is what I do, this is my job. I'm a critical care physician, I'm with an excellent teammate here, I've done the training. Yeah, this is, this is, we're gonna do our best for this baby. So that's interpreting it as a challenge as opposed to a threat. And that changes what's called the locus of control to an internal locus of control. I'm in control rather than an external locus of control. That's gonna control me. And that's the essence of um, not being frightened or stressed, that threat challenge appraisal. But it can be hard in the moment when everything's just happening. Uh, very fast, the patient's very sick, they're going off, unfamiliar environment, new teammate, uh, maybe a new registrar, new to pre-hospital care. It's hard. So there's some specific mindware tools that we encourage and Mike Lauria, uh, a physician and paramedic uh, in the States, uh, came up with this mnemonic, beat the stressful, which is breathe, talk, see, focus. So breathing is controlled breaths to control your autonomic hyperarousal. It will, it will, if I slow my breathing down, 
my heart rate will slow down in turn, I will widen my perception um, and uh, I'll feel more in control. The self-talk is the internal reassurance. I've got this, I'm with a great team, I've had the training. That's positive self-talk. C is visualization. In the helicopter or the ambulance on the way out to the sick baby, I may sit there quietly and visualize a perfect grade one laryngoscopy and the tube going in over the stylet super smoothly, a perfect end tidal CO2 waveform, everybody relaxed on scene. If I visualized it, it's more likely to happen like that afterwards. And then focus um, is a way of bringing yourself back into the moment and acting. Say for example, you have a can't intubate, can't oxygenate situation and you have to do a surgical cricothyroidotomy. You may have done one plenty of times on mannequins but never on a live human and it might feel unnatural for you to get a knife and stick it through a fellow human being's throat, but you're gonna have to do it. So perhaps you develop a phrase that you use every time you've done it in training. Okay? Every time you do it on the mannequin, you say cutting now, and as you say the word now, you cut skin. Cutting now, every time, cutting now. When you do a thoracostomy, cutting now. So that in the moment when you have to do it, uh, the partner's looking at you and you're looking at him and you're nodding, yep, I'm gonna have to do this now. You've got the blade, you've got the neck there. Sats are going beep, 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 beep. Cutting now, you just say it and then you focused and you, that, that link between what you're saying and what you're doing uh, reinforces the action. It might be a phrase, it might be a word, it might be a physical routine you do. Um, anything that just gets you in the zone for that moment. So, the mind wear, so there's the attitude, there's the stress management skills, bringing ourselves into the zone. And then there's cognitively offloading, using our bandwidth for what we need it for, thinking clinically, not worrying about all the superfluous stuff. So setting up for a rapid sequence induction and intubation, we'll just use a checklist. That way we know we're not gonna forget the capnography, we know all the monitoring's on, we know the blood pressure cuff is not on the same arm that the drugs are gonna go through and we'll automatically cycle an extra vase eight. Um, all that stuff is taken care of in the checklist. So we're free we're, with plenty of bandwidth to concentrate on what we need to do, communicate and resuscitate. And I find it really interesting how distractible we are. You know, we have such perceptual and cognitive limitations that we've evolved for good reason. That's how we got this far as a species, but it can really limit us. So if you're in the middle of a task, then you don't notice stuff going on around you. And we can think of examples like this. So our doctor paramedic team will do pre-hospital emergency anesthesia, some ketamine, some rocuronium, pop a tube in the trachea. And each of us will be in a kind of different mode in terms of our situational awareness. So let's think about it in evolutionary terms, okay? So you've got a gazelle. A gazelle is uh, wandering along um, in the savannah, chewing on some grass, and here's a twig snap and go, shit, what was that? It's a cheetah, all right? Then there's walking along a bit more, chewing, and then here's a rustle in the bushes. Oh my God, it's a lion, right? And the gazelle is in this constant state of hypervigilance, broadened situational awareness, okay? And that's how we have to be sometimes. The cheetah, on the other hand, sees the gazelle and she is in a completely different frame of mind, her attention is now focused completely on lunch for her kids, right? I'm gonna catch that gazelle, I'm gonna eat it and feed it to my cubs. So let's go, and then boom, um, she's gonna zoom along at um, a super high speed, focused on the gazelle, and isn't gonna notice anything else. You could brand her, burn into her skin, she's not gonna feel it, and that's great. But she might not notice the poacher in the Land Rover with the, with the gun. Um, so she's gonna miss stuff potentially while she's focused on that goal. And we're, when we're doing on-scene anesthesia, our routine normally is that the paramedic does laryngoscopy and intubation. The physician is in charge of the anesthesia, selecting the drugs, doses, giving them, making sure it's flushing in okay, checking the monitoring, making sure we've still got all our equipment ready and supporting the paramedic doing the intubation. The physician will take over if they need to, but uh, they very rarely need to. Um, so at that moment, as the physician, I'm in gazelle mode. I've got a widened situational awareness. All right, I, if a twig cracks, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick it up. I don't want to miss a desaturation. I don't want to miss an esophageal intubation, etc. cetera. Um, but the paramedic, I don't want them looking anywhere else. They're focused on the gazelle. They're in cheetah mode. And when they say, I've got a grade one view, can I have the bougie? Um, they're not going to look for the bougie. They're just going to expect it to be there and it's going to go in. Right. So um, we just need to be aware of those different phases of situational awareness and it may well be that once the tube is secured, we connect up to the ventilator. As the doctor, I now look after the tube and the paramedic starts organizing the extrication. So now the paramedic situational awareness is broad and I'm now the cheater not wanting to dislodge this tube, looking at the monitor, looking at the tube. So we have a kind of handoff process where one of us will have eyes on the patient, the other one's looking at other stuff. But then when I've got to go and do something else, I'll say, okay, I've got eyes off the patient now, paramedic, Copy, you've got eyes off, I have eyes on. So we have this f f um, closed loop communication to say which of us has the situational awareness for the clinical situation uh, and which of us doesn't. Um, Pull it back on my eyes, do I get is it a nice example of uh, a loss of situational awareness. So sometimes we'll like run a Tyrannosaurus Rex through the scene and then ask the team afterwards, what animal did you see? And they go, what animal? What? And so we've been doing that for a while. And when we ask them in the debrief, no one has ever seen the Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> ever. They never see it. All right. So it's just a good demonstration of how task focused you can become, which in that situation, doing a resuscitative hysterotomy was, you want them to be focused on that task. But it, it's kind of healthy to remind ourselves how uh, easy it is to miss other stuff. You know, a T-Rex is unlikely to walk past, but you know, a vehicle could come past and mow you down. So it's important to train that situational awareness. When Working in teams, another part of our mindware is just, or, or the tools or the kind of software, is how we interact with other members of the team. So I've mentioned closed loop communication, there's other aspects of good communication that we teach. Um, but also we, we want, always wanna avoid confrontation, but sometimes we walk into a situation, as I said before, where we have divergent goals from other clinicians and we practice and teach ways of influencing and persuading, persuading other humans to help us manage the patient the way our system would require us to. So I've mentioned a bit about the, the kind of mind wearing ourselves, how we talk about, how we talk to uh, other people. And then just a little bit about how we control our environment. This is really, really key. And this is where I think pre-hospital care differs from in hospital care, although you can take these learning points and apply them in hospital care and become more effective. So, you know, you have a patient who is, um, the, the, the path to the patient is obstructed by stuff. And we want to always establish and control a workspace. We think about safety first, but then we think about enough space, light, heat, noise, crowd, get in control of those things. So we teach our docs and paramedics to ask ourselves, do I move the things from the patient or do I move, sorry, yeah, or do I move the patient from the things? And uh, as we saw before, you have to be careful about what you're moving them towards. And some of you will have heard this earlier today, we were talking about in life support courses, we consider the kind of beginning of the interaction with the primary survey, the ABCDE assessment, and to get a plan from there. But the clock doesn't start with the primary survey. The clock starts in terms of your opportunity to influence other factors, get control of self, team, environment, before you touch the patient, when you arrive on scene, sometimes when you arrive at work. So that zero point on the clock gives you an opportunity to consider controlling yourself, controlling your team, controlling your environment before you manage your patient. And then we encourage periodic updates about what we found and establishing the priorities as a team, sharing a mental model so we can progress that mission trajectory. Um, so a zero point survey is, is a form of mind wear, if you like, that we encourage people to employ 
on their way to the scene or on arrival on the scene. So they don't get bitten by all the things that can go wrong that are actually nothing to do with the patient, but are so important. Next tip is train as you fight. We've worked really hard to make simulation more and more uh, realistic. So a lot of the time we will use live humans like Brian very kindly offering to be a drunken Irishman there. And he um, is one example of many actors and helpers that we use. So much better than an unrealistic mannequin at getting people in the zone. So that, that fidelity, that physical fidelity and simulation we think is really important. I mean, uh, Marty, one of the paramedics here gets stabbed in the chest. Okay. Good. He doesn't look a very good yeah, colour. Okay. okay, all right. Now we'll just get some oxygen there as well. Yeah, I just turned okay. it blue. All right, that's okay. He okay. looks really so we'll blue. Um, and he, it's not a pretty sight, is it? But um, he, you know, he deteriorates physiologically. He becomes bradypneic, bradycardic on the eye simulate. And so the team has to talk through a thoracotomy, but not do it on him. Uh, but it get, that team was in the zone. They were really feeling the stress of having a deteriorating human with them. So we use the iSimulate system, which enables us to create believable physiology on the monitor. But it also, the latest system, the so-called reality system, enables us to have the observers in a different room, looking at the monitoring numbers, looking at the audio visual of the sim without interfering with the sim. So completely removing the observers from the sim. The only people who are at the sim are part of it. And in fact, we've also removed the voice of God. So we employ confederates. So the paramedics who are the ground crew who are on scene working with the HEMS trainees, they will be instructed to provide all of the clinical information. So when the doc listens to the chest with the stethoscope, it will be one of the paramedics on scene that will say, there's still no air entry on the left. There will be no facilitator with a clipboard or an iPad giving the information. And it stops that disruption of the flow, if you like, because you haven't got your learners turning around to the facilitator to say, okay, what can I hear? Or is there a rash? Or we, we, we've done away with that. And that's been really, really useful, I think, for fidelity of the sim. We mark all our simulations and we find that there's usually four or five clinical objectives for each sim, but we're far more interested in the non-clinical stuff. So on our scoring sheet, We've got a lot of stuff about scene management, leadership, communication, situational awareness, cognitive resilience. That's the stuff we're really interested in. And we give the team a score at the end, as well as individuals. We're, we're interested in team output. So as well as simulation, which we love, uh, we have to teach procedures. And we found that there's no substitute for real tissue. Human cadaver labs are too expensive for us. Live animal labs are both expensive and ethically questionable. So uh, we have dead animals supplied from a meat supplier. We just ask them to leave the organs in and a good uh, pig there will provide a reasonable model for thoracostomy, for clamshell thoracotomy, for limb amputation, and so on. So we can get through a lot of stuff. Otherwise, we have to create our own part task trainers for things like hysterotomy. Another principle, what is tested is learned. So right from day one, we tell the doc paramedic team, you have an exam at the end of the week, just to let you know. Feel free to practice every day really hard for that. Know your equipment inside out, know the operating procedures. Um, and we don't test anything we haven't taught, but we do test a lot of stuff at the end of a week with a nine station objective structured practical assessment against the clock. They've got a minute to read instructions, and then nine minutes to do the uh, whatever's asked of them in the room, some of which I will keep secret. But we like to push the limits. We believe in stress exposure training. So we'll teach the mind where at the beginning, the beat the stress fool, and encourage people to identify during simulation when they are feeling overloaded and practice those tools. Because during the week, the simulations get harder and harder until on the last day they're extremely hard. And then in the exam, they really have to pull this stuff out of the bag and, and uh, keep themselves in the zone. 
So it's just amazing. Just human behavior is so amazing. Like when you're a junior resident, you do an ATLS course and you learn how to do a primary survey. And then you do it lots of times with the trauma team in hospital. But take that doctor and put them in a pre-hospital environment that they haven't worked in before. And they forget how to do a primary survey. They know they're supposed to. And then you say, what, what did you find when you looked at the pupils? Ah, oh, shit, I didn't look at the pupils. Um, so as something as simple as a primary survey, we have to reteach in this environment. And on day one, get them to do it, and then get them to do it with some distraction, like in this case. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. Now. Now. Who are you? Now. It's okay. Just keep this oxygen on. What's her name? Yep. What's she doing? So, I get, I'll my hey, doctor. Hey, doc. All right. Bring the oxygen on. He says, he says ambulance doc. Oh, okay. All right. Can you just stay nice and steady? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't touch me. Could you so, tell me his name? Oh, 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 uh, that's, that's literally the first day. Just They've done a primary survey workshop and then they have to apply it in various situations like this. And we want to see them complete the primary survey. You can't manage pre-hospital trauma patients properly if you haven't assessed them properly. They have to complete the primary survey. Um, and then that's just day one. So things get ramped up and ramped up and ramped up throughout the week. So it gets tougher and tougher. And the idea is in training, we want people to almost be overwhelmed. We want them to recognize that feeling and imply that, apply the tools uh, to manage it so that when they're on a real job, which is what this picture depicts, they're cool, all right? Nothing's as bad as it was when we did our training. That job was tough, but man, that was nowhere near what our training was like. That's, that's what we want people to say. We can't do all this on our own. Um, we get huge numbers of volunteers, mainly from the ambulance service and student paramedics who are fantastic at moulage and acting and so on. And we actively seek feedback. So um, it's really rewarding doing this because you get, like I say, we're really lucky to attract really, really good doctors and paramedics to come and work for us. We're so lucky. It's such a, a luxury. And they've often they've done pre-hospital jobs elsewhere for other helicopter services in other countries or, or high level critical care jobs. But you know, just from the last induction, uh, we, we got this. And this is quite typical of the feedback that we get. This course has been a complete privilege and the best educational experience of my career. The amount of effort that's been put in by the staff makes you want to do well, not just for yourself, but to justify their effort. I am a different doctor now than I was at the beginning of the course. Thank you. That, yeah, that just makes it all worth it, reading that feedback. This, it can be a life-changing experience going through this training, and uh, which is why it takes such a massive team effort. So I'm part of a, you know, I'm one cog in a big machine, and I'm really, really lucky to be part of that machine. Um, and uh, it's an absolute privilege to work there, and also to be here and share the learning points with you. So those of you involved in training, feel free to contact me if you want to discuss any of this in any more detail at any point. Otherwise, I will leave you with a cat picture. Thanks.